This is a Canicurio podcast by Cannabis Media, your source for cannabis and hemp license news directly from the data fall. I'm your host, Ed Keating, and today we're joined by Chris Cohen, president of Square Grouper 360. Chris, welcome. Hello there. Glad to have you on. Haven't seen you since Las Vegas. Uh, a lot's happened in the last couple months, but the, the the top story of the hour is, you know, Weed Maps was trying to get on the Super Bowl, <laughs> trying to figure out advertising and marketing, and it uh, looks like the, the network's probably shut them down. Given your background, I'd love to hear your take on it. Yeah, so my background is um, I was in broadcast television for 15 years, um, 10 of those in management. I worked for big companies, Cox, Fox, Sinclair. Um, and so I have a really good television background and I've been in cannabis the last 12 years. Um, so I definitely have that background. Um, I actually talked to Weed Maps about how they should go about their tact and the networks are never gonna let them on. They're never gonna let um, a, a cannabis commercial on national. Um, yeah. One way they might be able to do it is to call the lo local affiliates and, and advertise in cities instead of nationally. So that's maybe one way around it. I love the commercial. Yeah. Um, I thought the creative was great. It was non-offensive. They could have run that commercial, no problem. Um, yeah. But the, yeah. Networks, the networks aren't going to budge until banking budges. Until we get banking, the networks aren't going to look at um, anything we're doing. Oh, that makes sense. Well, I appreciate yeah. uh, your perspective with you know bringing in the television and the cannabis side of things. So, um, if you could, could you tell us a little bit more about Square Grouper Three Hundred and Sixty and your relation to MNI Targeted Media? Because you, you've obviously been you know doing some great things there, and I'd love to hear more about it. Definitely, I was in the cannabis space. I was an early adopter. I started in two thousand nine out in California. Wow, I was really part of the um, that legacy group that got legalization through in California. That went to all the county commissioners in every single city and every single town and every county, the city commissioners, educating them on the industry from like 2011 to 2014 to really get that momentum to where we are today. Um, I owned a couple companies, um, a manufacturing company, a cultivation company, wow. um, ended up selling those in 2019. I really saw the writing on the wall in California. Um, being in the industry so early, I was able to really forecast what was going to happen and i knew it was going to be a tough run and so i figured let me get out um i had an offer to get out from a canadian company and i went ahead and sold and i said i can always get back in in the future when things get a little better and i've mm -hmm. been consulting since um and so what i did is i took my tv background um and my cannabis background and someone put me in front of mni who i knew of when from my television days i used to sell against them oh, okay um, yeah, and started doing some research on them. And they spent three years um, working in the cannabis space, really trying to figure out what the needs were. But they were struggling navigating the industry. Um, huh. Like so many people from outside yeah. the industry, it's so hard to navigate. Um, and so they brought me on to help them navigate the waters um, and get the message out what they're trying to sell to everybody. So so what did you do differently? Like, you know, how, how did your approach differ because obviously you had this decade of experience and you know anybody who's listening to this podcast has, has heard me talk about sort of the can of clueless can of curious can of serious you know as people just get smarter about the industry you know they move into that can of serious uh level and I'm, I'm assuming that's probably where you've brought them now so you know what changes did you make and, and what was your approach chris i'll be honest the first thing i did and you're gonna love this answer um i brought on cannabis media I love um, that I answer. Knew, I know. I knew about <laughs> you. I, I've known about you since you started. I've been in the industry for a while. Um, I knew exactly what you did. And they were having a hard time navigating the licenses. They, they also have 25 account executives across the country. Wow. They couldn't tell where companies were headquartered, who to assign what account to what rep. And so um, we went ahead and um, you know, got your platform. And I really started um, putting lists together for every account executive across the country. Where are all these companies headquartered? And also, m and is a little picky. They don't do, um, they're not picky, but their platforms are not cheap. They're um, spending $1,500 a month with them probably isn't going to work. So it's really more of a $7,500, $10,000 a month spend. And so that knocks out a lot of the smaller cannabis companies. And they were calling on those small cannabis companies and getting nowhere because their, their, their buy-in was so large. So, so I really took your platform and... You know, I knew a lot of the players were already and then, you know, playing in the platform, figuring out how many states they're in. Um, I was able to put a count list together for the um, reps. So um, in terms of MNI, who are they trying to reach? Like, who do they want to get on their platform, I guess, from the cannabis industry as advertisers? Is it 
you know, it doesn't sound like it would be a store. Would it be a chain or an MSO or is it a brand? You know, who, who is their ideal customer if they were to walk in and join us on this call right now? Um, the way I did it, I, I really separated out. So for dispensaries, for retail, multiple locations, any, any dispensary yeah. with multiple locations anywhere in the country is um, a definite because they usually spend about $5,000 each per location. So anyone with multiple locations would be a target. Um, brands are a big target of ours right now, especially all these brands that are going direct to consumer online. They need traffic to those websites. And that's what MNI does the best. And so that's really our big focus right now is the brands going direct to consumer. Um, we also target um, delivery companies. We've had big success with the online companies, the big tech companies um, are yep. doing business with us. Um, Dutchie and Ease are two big client of ours. Got it. Got it. Well, yeah, that makes sense. And, and, and that, you know, I imagine you can sort of get into the almost like the geofencing kind of thing, too. If you're trying to reach a certain cohort or whatnot, you've got the technology and whatnot to uh, to, to to bring that in. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of m and uh, use of cannabis media, you talked about, you know, essentially helping build territories. Do you ever run into situations where, uh, yeah, I guess for m and they've got some that are house accounts or, or basically named accounts versus those that are local. How, how, how does it, how do they view the sales world in terms of uh, how they deploy their sales force? It's really based on territories. So they okay. have 25 reps around the country. They're based in all the big cities and it's all territories. So if a company is headquartered in um, California, the California rep has it. it. And we really do it basically since there's so, it's so spread out, we do it where the headquarters are is how I assign it Got instead it. of where the store and where their locations are. It's where the headquarters are. Well, and that's where the sale is going to get done because you want to be selling yeah. at the sea level, not chasing around every yeah. store and going to every mm -hmm. manager. Okay. That, that, that makes and, sense. And turnover has been so massive in the cannabis industry. Really. We want to talk to the top people because they're not leaving. Yes. Right. Um, M and I spend an enormous. Um, I know all the companies are spending a lot of time with and with buyers that leave after three four months, and you start all over. Yeah, and yeah. So indeed. really getting above that level is really important. That's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. And and you're right because you know one of the things that we track in the product is you know when we do our phone calling, one of the things that we ask in addition to store size and whatnot is who's the purchasing manager and what are the best hours to reach them. And we have that in the app as like a news story for a lot of the stores and. But those names change. Like when we call again, it's like, oh, it's not Chris anymore; it's Ed. So, uh, so it's it's definitely you know trying to keep up on the on the on the change and the dynamism uh, in in the industry. Yeah. So, so one other area I always like to ask in our podcast is sort of the you know the the strategy piece, point of differentiation. So, if you go to a cannabis trade show. Mm -hmm there's a lot of media brands out there that are all fighting for share a wallet. You know, there's a million magazines. There's a lot, there's still lots of shows that are trying to come back in. Um, there's lots of ways to spend that marketing and advertising dollars. So what makes M and I targeted media, you know, stand apart from the crowd? Cause you know, based on what you said before, you've got some real marquee clients. So obviously something's resonating. So, so help us understand that. There is so many, there are a lot companies out there and i've actually i'm um, taking the task and met with a lot of them because i want to know what they're doing um we've actually partnered with a couple companies we've done yeah. data integrations with philo we've done data integration with new frontier so even with meeting with the competitors we find out there's actually some synergy between us oh, um, at times but i think the biggest thing is with m and i um this is a really big company they're owned by Dot Dash Meredith. Um, Dot Dash Meredith, and they were owned by Meredith and they're now Dot Dash Bottom. This is a really, Dot Dash Meredith is a massive company. They're a top 10 um, company in the world for website traffic to all their sites. Huh. Um, the only ones bigger than them is Microsoft, Amazon, and a couple others. So they own all the magazines. They're People Magazine, all the Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated, um, and tons of websites, liquor.com. Um, health websites, Investopedia. So they have massive platforms. And so I think that's the differentiating point with M&I. This is a really big company. Yeah. This is a massive company in the space. Um, M&I is their online targeting um, division, national division. So it's it's just their all, but this is a big company that brings um, big tools to the industry for cannabis. Well, I imagine two big data too. I know that's a word that a lot of people throw around, but if you've got brands like that, you're touching a lot of households, I would imagine, and just have more data than most, I would think if, you know, with that kind of reach. 
the amount of uh, zero party and first party data is um, huge. We have ton, we have so much of that data, and that's why the integrations with the cannabis companies have been so important because we have that zero and first party data integrating it with cannabis information and really being able to target these customers on a granular level right. has been really successful for us. I think that's what it is. Yeah. And so it, some of the other things that you know we talked to previously are, you know, the the depth of the advertiser relationship you have and also this concept of, you know, digital first e-commerce, you know, the 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 whole being digital not just print focused, I'm assuming. So could you, you know, drill into those a little bit more uh, in, in terms of how they relate to the the success? Yeah, we're extremely digitally focused. Um, print is a big part of this company, but um, you know everything's moving digital and everything's moving online, um, especially for the cannabis companies. Digital is perfect. One thing M and I have done: they spent three years building a program programmatic platform, where they went to publishers all over the world and leaned on them. Basically, this is a big company and said, "Hey, hey we need you to take our cannabis clients. Um, free, and as long as the creative is okay, we need you to take it." So they went around and they got 15,000 publishers around the world wow. to pre-approve cannabis advertising. And I think that's the big differentiator that M&I has over everyone. They have a massive customized platform. for yeah, cannabis. That, that sounds like just a giant network of places yeah. where you can put ads and not, not, not remnants, but, but ads. So. And it's not small. It's, you know, it's every website, but there's big websites. It's Fox sports it's CBS sports is on there. Vice um, there's big publishers on there also. So. Um, we could definitely target in so many ways. That's the really, I think that's the difference. Why M and I, we can really granular target on a, on a target on a granular level where some of our competitors can't. Yeah, absolutely. And we've offered this. We we're actually offering this platform to um, the other to perceived competitors. I don't think there's any competitors. I think we're all providing a service. Right. Um, but we're starting to offer this platform to some of the other agencies. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. When I, when I used to work in the uh, publishing advertising space, I, I know that uh, uh, one of our members had a network that was pretty unique. And, and by bringing together, actually, it was all business trade magazines, they were able to build enough of a network where they could finally bring in like big advertisers, like I think Mercedes Benz, because now you could you know give enough of the audience of a, of a, you know, a highly wealthy B2B audience and show those kind of ads. So, uh, so, so good for you guys for building out a platform that, 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 that I'm sure that's a great asset to have. And they actually spent three years on it before they even rolled it out. So this wasn't something they rolled out in pieces. They really did it right. Put it together, yeah. um, and rolled it out. So, um, you know, talked about some of the others in the industry that, that may benefit from this, uh, over the last, you know, six, eight weeks, there've been a couple acquisitions in the space where, MJ Biz Daily, Marijuana Business Daily got bought by Emerald. Green Market Report was acquired by Cranes. Do you expect to see more of these deals? Because you're sort of at a unique uh, uh, catbird seat to, to, to the industry in, in terms of advertising and marketing. I think those are the those two were really um, almost outliers. They were so big, they were ready to be acquired. Um, Green Market Report's done such a good job. They have such a neat, they both have really great niches. Yes, is what it is. And they have big followings. And so they were um, primed for that. Um, I think there's going to be more of that coming in the future. I don't know who it's going to be. I'm really looking more at the weed maps, the leaflies and some of these other companies, because I think they're the ones that might be in place soon. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, and yeah, and there, there's, there's a couple private companies, too, that have... Uh, you know, gotten pretty good valuations and, you know, maybe a war chest. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see because the, the, the bloom seems to be off the SPAC rows these days. So it may be a more traditional uh, approach to uh, combining companies. We'll have to see. I think um, you're going to see a lot of M&A in the cannabis industry this year. As far as the media side, I think that's going to come. But yeah, I mean, it's, there's going to be so much, so much M&A this year. Yeah, I think so. And then, you know, we have a database that's tracking it now. I think we're just under 500 deals that we've managed to cover in the last four or five years. Most of them are, you know, the last two, three years, but it's been really interesting to see. And that's more on people buying licenses, but we also track the, the ancillary pieces as well. So uh, we'll be keeping an eye on those uh, too, because it's, it's fascinating to watch, you know, for me, how the software stack is starting to collapse a bit. You don't need 80 point of sale vendors out there. You know, in the end, there's probably going to be five, three, yeah. two, we'll see. It'll take some time to get there. Now, one of the other big uh, trends that, that I think is interesting and really a lot of it comes from my background in compliance is 
similar to pharma, there's a lot of compliance around cannabis advertising and marketing. And I'm curious, you know, how you handle that, especially with all the work that, um, that, that uh, M&I has done in terms of, you know, three years of work and building a network. How do you manage that? Because I know here in Connecticut, when they first released their rules and regs, it was like a 16 page PDF that looked like it came right out of the Federal Trade Commission. I mean, you know, lots of rules and regs. So how, how do you manage that at, at scale, Chris? It is not easy. The one good thing about being with M&I, this is a really big company and they have a big marketing department. Um, and so the marketing department's actually put together a state-by-state -state advertising guide and we keep up on it. And so we spent the time and went in and put out. So when we go to an advertiser, we know what's going on in that state. Um, it's not, let's get a deal done and figure it out. It's, this is what you can and can't do. Yep. Um, I'll give you a great example. I ran into an issue on Maine last week. I was on a call with um, a company in Maine with my rep. And we realized they changed the laws, no online advertising. Wow. Maine's, no online advertising. We couldn't believe it. There's workarounds, but this is um, really backwards. This is how far behind some of these regulatory bodies are on the states. How do they expect the cannabis company to succeed if they can't advertise? And it's um, really been difficult for us to comprehend that. There may, the barriers are difficult to advertise. And that's got to change. The, the only way these companies are going to be able to compete is advertising. Every other category is allowed to do it. Yeah. So yeah. why not cannabis? So one thing we do is we keep on the state-by-state -state rules. But um, I've made some calls to some of the county commissions and the city commissions trying to get things changed. My prior life, I did a lot of that. Yeah. Um, I think my 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 future life, there's going to be a lot of that. <laughs> um, there needs to be a there needs to be a lobbying arm to help these cannabis advertising rules with the cities and the states. They don't get it. Yeah, and it's just a matter of getting in front of them and educating them. And that's something I might take on here in the future. Yeah, and I think there is a there is a cannabis marketing association uh, that, that is. is on our radar screen. So, you know, I, I could see that maybe falling into their um, purview. Mm -hmm. We're members of, of CMA. We love working with them. They definitely do a lot of work on that end. But it's yeah. tough. I mean, there's so many. There's, it, it, it goes down to the cities almost. You can have one city that bans advertising and the city right next door is OK with it. And so there's no. Um, there's no structure to it. There's no consistency. So it's, it's, that's what makes it tough too. And God forbid, you, you know, you put an ad on the side of a bus and it goes from a town where it's legal to where it's not, you know, it's just, uh, you know, creates havoc, uh, you know, to comply. Well, the problem is the clients um, get nervous because they can lose their license. I mean, they've put in their whole life into this cannabis industry. They put in everything and it makes them hesitant to advertise because they're scared about getting their license. Um, either pulled or suspended or uh, over advertising. And so it makes it a little tough for us at times also. Yeah. I remember one, one of the first uh, interviews I did was with uh, uh, Yahoo Finance Online a couple of years ago. And we we came up just by doing the research on a book we wrote on the, some of the 10 weirdest, wackiest rules and regulations. And a lot of them were around advertising, like what font you could use on the sign, what colors, uh, no neon in certain states, uh, or the sign couldn't be on after a certain hour. Uh, in Washington, D.C., you couldn't uh, operate a, a, like a cannabis uh, business along with a gas station. Yeah. Because why? I have no idea, but that was in the rule books, and I don't know if it's still there. But it, you know, definitely makes it a challenge for people to comply with. And you know, sadly, it's something that people can really run afoul of if they're not if they're not careful. Yeah, I think it's. I think the cannabis industry talks to the county commissioners, the city commissioners, the regulatory bodies on big picture items. They just don't talk to them about advertising. And so it's really down on the list is the, what it is. And so that just needs to come up higher on the list to be talked about. Yeah. I, I think all those rules and regs will change over the next couple of years. I think they're going to get easier. They really will. I think you're right. As, as things become more mainstream and normal. So totally agree. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of advertising and marketing trends, sort of, you know, building out of the compliance side, what should people be looking for in the next year or so? Like, well, what do you see, uh, you know, once again, from, from your, your, your perch? I'm actually going to defer to MNI on this. And so MNI puts out a lot of blogs. Yeah. Um, and they put a blog out at the beginning of the year on um, five trends to look for this year. So I want to uh, go through them. Yeah, let's hear them. Um, yeah, personal, personalization and digital marketing, zero and first party data. That's a big trend. Um, accumulating as much zero and first party data as you can before the cookie world. Um, data visualization is another big trend. Um, infographics, stories, video, instead of um, banner ads, video ads, um, going on video ads online. And so that's a big trend. 
Um, consumer privacy is, you know, that's on everything. That's a, that's a massive trend and how everyone's dealing with that. Um, AI and it's the, the widespread adoption of our, our AI. Yeah. It's yeah. a big trend that we're seeing everywhere. Yeah. And the last one is QR code marketing, which was all over the Super Bowl. I don't know if you noticed this weekend. There was bing, 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 bing. everywhere. So QR code marketing, I think that's the biggest one on the list that I'm, I see it everywhere now. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what I think it's made things really easy for the consumer. I mean, just thing it, it takes you right where you need to go. Yeah. Um, but every commercial, um, I mean, most of the commercials in the Super Bowl, I couldn't, I was like stunned. Yeah. yeah. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. So yeah. oh, that, that, that's great. Now, um, going back to MNI, what are their goals for, for 2022? I think the biggest goals are they're new to the cannabis industry. They're, they're not a legacy operator. They've been in here a couple of years. They spent, I think they've spent more time on the category than they have being in the category, which is oh. what you need to do. So they're prepared, but it's really a continuing establishing relationships, establishing those partners, those long-term partnerships. Um, email, continue using email marketing. Um, we use your, um, we use cannabis media exclusively for email marketing. One thing that we've noticed is the, the email blasts to a thousand people really aren't working anymore. We've gotten more personal. We're doing one-to-one -one outreach now instead of blast outreach. We're doing both, but really <laughs> concentrating on one-to-one -one outreach. And it's really working getting appointments. Personalized emails, showing that you actually looked at the website and know a little bit about the company's business before reaching out to them makes a huge difference. Great. Um, now, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, go on. Oh, uh, I was like, go ahead. Um, and the other question I wanted to ask that, that, that I often ask is, you know, cannabis mm -hmm. media you know, covers cannabis, but also hemp CBD. Where does CBD come in for you guys, if at all? We actually made a pivot at the end of the year last year. And we're like, let's really take a look at the CBD category. We felt the cat, the cannabis category is a little stalled right now. There's, there's, um, mm. it, it's, it's a little slow right now. Um, wish it was in California is really making it tough. We don't do a lot of California business because the companies out there are really struggling. Um, and they're not putting a lot in advertising right now. Mm -hmm. So we're like, let's take a look at CBD. And one of the reasons we want to take a look at it, they're in a two-year window right now that cannabis was in in 2017 to 2019. No, very little regulation, very little taxes. It's a way to really get your business going before regulation comes. Right. And so we made the pivot and we started using your database, um, start reaching out to CBD companies. We're, we're looking at all the retailers, of course, but really the brands, um, is the big one. Yeah. Anyone well, who's, it, got a, who's got a website selling a line is a target of ours. Oh, excellent. Well, and I was going to say, you know, having compiled some of the CBD retailers, uh, you know, myself working with the team, it's fascinating when you look at a Florida, Louisiana, and you just sort of sort them by name, you start to see really familiar names. In Florida, if I remember, Publix supermarkets and Walmart, I think, and, and Dixie are, are, are the big chains. Yeah. And those companies are well-versed in how to work with CBD, or I'm sorry, consumer packaged goods, CPG, CBD. So yeah. they know how to bring in new products and, and there's a whole way to get your product on the shelves in those stores. So for people who've got that consumer packaged goods background, you know, making that entree is, is perhaps not as hard as maybe getting into a dispensary where, where, you know, there's limited shelf and it's a smaller kind of business, et cetera. So. I agree. You have so many more shelves you can get on. That's so limited. The cannabis is limited really to dispensaries. And when you get in CBD, it's gas stations to Sephora to um, any retailer, really. I mean, any of um, the pet category in CBD is massive. Yeah. Um, yeah. You go into Petco, you go into PetSmart, there's a whole aisle now. Well, yeah, and, and I think it's, uh, you know, F Florida and, and uh, Louisiana have really gotten out ahead of everybody. But my, my favorite license uh, in, in almost the whole database is uh, in Florida, there is a CBD alligator meat uh, license holder. So, uh, you know, you can really get very knit. So if you have any advertisers that, you know, need to reach that group, you know, uh, you got cannabis media to lead the way. You can infuse anything. That's what's <laughs> crazy about the CBD cannabis industry. And I own a manufacturing company. I know that you can infuse anything. And I think you're going to see niche products like that coming out in the future. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, listen, Chris, thanks so much for joining us on today's podcast. I'm your host, Ed Keating. Stay tuned for more updates from the Data Vault.